Jan van Eyck is one of the greatest artists of the Northern Renaissance, but what is it that makes him stand out from his contemporaries? Van Eyck's truth is the incredible depth and detail of color, light and texture that only his paintings give. The painter's world is hyper-real. Scholars never found the church interiors and landscapes that appear in some of his paintings. They do not present precise locales nor specific historical events, but rather depict Van Eyck's own idealized vision of things. To be able to understand themes of his art, in this lecture we will explore the historical context of Van Eyck's time, because surely the attitudes and habits of the society in the early 15th century Netherlands is what makes up the essence of the paintings. They are not only about religious ideology and symbolism, but also tell us a story woven around the lives of individuals portrayed in them. A part of the religious strivings of Van Eyck's contemporaries was the desire to negotiate personal salvation and eternal life. The religious experience of that time involved buying indulgences in clerical positions, paying for masses of, for the dead, going on pilgrimages and commissioning paintings that displayed one's piety. And this is one of the major themes the artist's realism expresses. We will examine one of the most famous altarpieces, the Ghent altarpiece, Van Eyck's portraits, furthermore the virgins, and finally one of the most important works in art history, the Arnold Finney couple. And while looking at the paintings, pay attention to what you feel or think would be best if you write it down. This will be your personal experience from Van Eyck's art, hopefully enjoyable. Let's look a little bit into Van Eyck's life. He made, as we would say today, a good career at the Burgundian court in Bruges. He became a famous and successful court painter. This meant that the main source of his income was Duke Philip the Good. From surviving documents, it is known that Van Eyck, as a court artist, was forbidden by the rules of the Bruges Painters Guild from working in the open market. For the most part, his non-ducal work was limited to people who were in some way connected with the court. Thus, his income and status were more or less defined by his posts at court. Painter to the Duke and Varlet de Chambre, a title and salary given to many servants at court. Grocers, for instance which means that Van Eyck was not ranked particularly high among its servants. His position, however, provided him with a fairly good income. In 1432, seven years after entering ducal service, he was able to purchase a stone-fronted house in Bruges. Before we examine the world of Van Eyck's images, it's worth understanding what his life was like at the Burgundian court. What did the painter do to earn his income from Duke Philip? From the outset, Court records state that he was to be available to execute paintings whenever the Duke wished him to. The Burgundian court moved from residence to residence and the Duke seems to have been constantly engaged in remodeling or redecorating one or other of his numerous dwellings. Especially during the early years of his association with the court, the later 1420s, Van Eyck was at the Duke's call, staying at various places in order to assist with particular projects. To some degree, this way of life continued into the 1430s after Van Eyck had married and bought his home in Bruges. Did Van Eyck design or execute wall paintings for Duke Philip? Possibly, for it's known that the Duke often had such paintings undertaken in his mansions. Did Van Eyck polychrome or gild sculpture for these places? Perhaps, for it's known that in 1432 he polychromed statues depicting the Counts of Flanders for the city of Bruges. Another, especially intriguing application of Van Eyck's creative talents was the design and production of court festivities, banquets, and food decorations. At one of the Duke's banquets held in the mid-1430s, a huge pie was brought in, from which a man emerged, dressed as an eagle, whereupon countless doves were released, which then settled on tables. It is known that other important ducal painters conceived and executed such extravagances. It's likely that Van Eyck also participated in similar courtly obsessions. The kind of works Van Eyck most often made at court are not at all like those from his hand which survive today. These are mostly small panel paintings. Did he also produce small panel paintings for the Duke? There is no definite record of that. Evidence shows that at that time panel paintings were not considered valuable. The major exception to this were portraits both of living family members and ancestors. These were intended to form a part of the historical record and were passed on to family members. 
the nobility favoured the traditionally elitist art media. Tapestry, metalwork out of gold and silver, and richly decorated manuscripts. Such items were more costly and thus more prestigious than the more recent invention of panel painting, produced for the first time in its fully developed form by Van Eyck and his contemporaries. Although the Duke and his circle praised the painter's artistic genius, he didn't give top priority to panel paintings, as they did not appear to have satisfied the court's extravagant taste. For Duke Philip, Van Eyck was engaged on certain large works. What were these important projects? The Duke placed great importance on his big life, which was in part a self-consuming spectacle. The conspicuous lifestyle was based on an enormous appetite for consumption. For the court, its foodstuffs comprised one of the highest forms of art. One could imagine that court consuming a cake designed, decorated, perhaps even painted by Van Eyck, the greatest artist of the day. The goal of the Burgundian court wasn't that of being represented on a wooden panel. They didn't appreciate or require the complex storytelling of a painting. The nobility, most probably, didn't encourage him to use his illusionistic skills in order to recreate their way of life. That wasn't what they considered the highest calling of an artist. They wanted Van Eyck's talents to be immediately present in the midst. Others at court, such as those functionaries who had risen from the middle class, did commission panel paintings from him. And in these works, Van Eyck gave to their lives and to their ambition all the glitter they could imagine, but not perhaps own. Van Eyck was himself a court functionary, an individual from the middle class who had no inherited wealth and whose children would have none either. Although the Duke praised Van Eyck's talents and the painter was well remunerated, he was never given a particularly elevated rank in the court bureaucracy. Such was the life of a functionary, perhaps successful and honored, but still dependent on the Duke's favor. Artistic patronage in the 15th century. The main driving force behind the development of panel painting in Northern Europe in the 15th century was artistic patronage. Well-to-be individuals or the donors commissioned paintings for various purposes. Examining them will be crucial in understanding the imagery in Van Eyck's paintings. The donors depicted on the panels of Dutch painters in the 15th century were most of the time bureaucratic functionaries who were essential in the social and political history of the Burgundian territories. Starting from the last quarter of the 14th century and continuing for about a century, the Burgundian dukes kept a large bureaucracy of lawyers and financial advisors to administer their lands. These functionaries were largely drawn from the bourgeoisie. What Philip the Good did was create a social class, newly rich, whose position and success depended entirely on ducal appointment. These well-educated, middle-class bureaucrats were able to gain high, high financial rewards during their service under the duke, land and beautiful houses, lavishly fitted out. These functionaries were the most important social group promoting and patronizing the panel painters. In early Netherlandish painting, commissions by lay patrons outnumbered clerical ones by more than two to one. Among the identifiable lay patrons, twice as many came from the court functionaries as did from the nobility. This functionary group fostered noble aspirations, but were usually not in line to be united. The combination of having middle class origin and noble pretensions led many of these functionaries to patronize panel painting. Due to the scarce documentation from that time, information about the subject may sometimes seem to be controversial. The court of Burgundy is sometimes described as the chief employer of artists. Yet court records reveal few specific payments for panel paintings. The court and nobility continued to favor the traditional and expensive luxury items such as tapestry, goldsmith work and manuscripts. There are several reasons for the development of panel painting. It was a new and exciting artistic medium, more technically refined as well as rich and complex in the effects it could achieve. Similarly, the functionary class was then newly developing. Panel painting was really the only art that the functionaries could see as being their own, symbolizing their own rise to power, an art reflecting their own aspirations and illusions. Functionaries developed a taste for noble living, although they weren't usually in the position to commission the most expensive objects. 
Perhaps Annals appealed to them because they allowed the functionaries to maintain the illusion of a luxurious life. Panel painters, such as Van Eyck, for example, made images of objects made of precious metal, glass, cloth, and fur. They also produced illusionistic paintings of sculpture, which could truly trick the eye. It was certainly a cost-effective solution. Due to the development of oil painting, sometimes erroneously attributed solely to Van Eyck, these works were able to accommodate all kinds of effects, textures, objects, and illusions of one sort or another. So what was the most essential purpose of the panel paintings? In the 15th century, private devotion and lay religious ideal was the guiding principle for which panels were crucial. This ideal was mostly taken up by the bourgeoisie and urban dwellers. Drawn from the middle class, but now moving beyond it as they rubbed elbows and attempted to join old, established and wealthy noble families, the functionaries could have regarded panel painting as being well suited for their purposes. Visual realism of early Netherlandish painting gave a glow of fine crystal to their pretensions. It was new, a child of the time, as they were. Many forces are said to lie behind the development of such realism in painting, but to no one group did it apply more vividly than to the functionaries. The Ghent Altarpiece The Ghent Altarpiece is the largest and most complex set of panel paintings executed in the Netherlands in the 15th century. Moreover, it's the first oil painting of such scale. The Ghent Altarpiece was commissioned around 1426 by Jodocus Weid, a patrician city dweller of Ghent. The work on this large altarpiece was started by Hubert van Eyck, the brother of Jan. It's unclear now who painted what parts of it, but the work was completed by Jan himself in 1432. This is a monumental polyptych painting centered on themes of redemption and salvation. The altarpiece consists of 24 separate panels, with 12 different panels on view, whether the altar is open or closed. On the exterior of the work, 10 relatively large figures are portrayed. They include contemporaries, imitations of sculpted saints and holy figures from the Old and New Testaments. On the inner part, hundreds of figures populate 12 separate panels. They range from the massive and enthroned God the Father to the elders, bishops, confessors, martyrs, hermits, saints, knights and judges beside and below him, all of whom lead us toward the central adoration of the Lamb. Of the Holy Lamb. The Lamb symbolizes Christ's sacrifice, and Lamb of God is a title for Jesus that appears in the Gospel of John. The painter's work was clearly intended to be a spectacular public work of art. In this way, it is distinctive, even unique in Van Eyck's career. No other painting by the artist meant to be publicly displayed in a church. No other work was so obviously and consciously a complex display of church personages and church doctrine. Undoubtedly, in part because of its purpose and scale, this remarkable creation has remained in its original location, the St. Babo Cathedral in Ghent. It's one of the few 15th century Netherlands panel paintings and the only work by Van Eyck to be so honored. In this work we see several innovative features. Firstly, the realism in the rendering of the first couple, the nude figures of Adam and Eve, marks a new era in religious painting. Secondly, his panoramic landscapes appear to recede far into the distance. Van Eyck uses atmospheric perspective, predating the naturalistic landscapes of Leonardo da Vinci by over 50 years. Thirdly, on the exterior panels we see the use of the grisaille technique, which is a method of painting in grey monochrome, typically to imitate sculpture. Grisaille wasn't Van Eyck's invention, but he excelled in it. Sculpture was expensive at that time, and grisaille was used as a way to imitate it. There are several interesting points as regards the circumstances of the creation of the Ghent altarpiece, as well as the meaning of its imagery. The number of scenes, the variety of participants, the specificity of Latin inscriptions, together these features indicate that great care was taken in assembling and relating the work's various part, parts. It was surely not a random process that led to such expensive, time-consuming and visually impressive results. Could the painter himself or his patron, a local politician and businessman, have alone been responsible for this task? All modern scholars have concluded this wasn't the case. 
A learned theologian seems to have advised the artist. The most specific supposition made in this regard is that Van Eyck's advisor was Olivier de Longue, the prior of the Ghent church in which the altarpiece was destined to hang. He is the author of an extensive treatise on the sacrament of the Eucharist, an appropriate literary analogue for the visual complexities of the Ghent altarpiece. De Longue's thought also corresponds with the image in the way it presents a traditional view of the nature and necessity of church ritual. As depicted by Van Eyck, the saints, martyrs, prophets, and highly placed ecclesiastics, both bishops and confessors, lead the strictly regulated religious and social groups reflecting the societal structure of that time. As expressed by the De Long and reflected in the Ghent altarpiece, these views do not take into account the appearing opposition to traditional theology, nor the growing importance of private devotion. They reiterate the centuries-old claim of the church hierarchy to absolute authority. Why the first monumental public panel painting made in the Netherlands should be so traditional in its theological thrust is an interesting question. Scholars suppose that when the work was executed, Van Eyck's career was just beginning, and his brother Hubert was an artist of largely local significance. That's why the artists may have been subject to a powerful and opinionated patron. After all, the church was still a powerful institution at that time. And about the patron, Jodekus White, we know only a little. What is known suggests a person with no strong new ideas or affiliations. A person who was committed to the church for endowing masses for the souls of his wife, himself and his family. And yet he didn't have the ambition to adjust to his own more personal devotional ends the means offered by the church. What he might have personally done was to have Van Eyck include secular forces, the just judge and the soldiers of Christ on the lower left of two panels of the polyptic. As a patrician leader of Ghent, White might well have identified with these individuals that take a secondary position in the hierarchical structure of the painting. In this sense, White seems to have been content to take his traditional, lesser role in the carefully arranged procession of the faithful. Since the Ghent altarpiece was meant to be a public work of large scale and housed in a church, the ecclesiastical authorities were careful to consider and approve its message, and it's highly possible that they were deliberately countering even excluding any new lay developments in theology, proclaiming their traditional and exclusive prerogative to be the foremost rulers on these matters. In the altarpiece we find a manifesto of a view of religion and society that made only small allowances for diverse or changing lay interests. Its all-encompassing focus on a powerful ecclesiastical hierarchy was never again to be repeated in Van Eyck's known works. Along with paintings and religious themes, Van Eyck produced a substantial number of secular portraiture of aristocratic and middle-class patrons in Northern Europe, a genre formerly reserved for the ruling members of society. Although Van Eyck's portraits may seem somber, they are immediately recognizable. The elements typical for Van Eyck's secular portraits are the innovative three-quarters pose against a dark, flat background, a strong sense of light highlighting the identifying characteristics of the sitter's features, and the artist's amazing ability to capture the various textures of different fabrics. Most striking, perhaps, is Van Eyck's careful attention to the nuance of flesh tones of the hands and facial features. His meticulous attention to detail let us see that literally every wrinkle on the face is depicted in the portraits. The painting man in a red turban is the most prized of his extant portraits, and there is a general consensus that it represents another new genre, the self-portrait. The innovative posture is now taken for granted, however, in religious painting and images of royalty at that time, it was common for the figure to directly face the viewer. In Italy, it was most common for the patrons to be depicted in profile, perhaps a nod to classical antiquity. Virgin and Child Four images of seated virgin and child and two standing ones have come down to us. The seated versions were executed over a short span of time, between 1434 and 1437. These are Virgin and Child with Canon van der Paul, Virgin and Child with Nicholas Roland, Luca Madonna and the Dresden Triptych. The standing ones refer to the last years of Van Eyck's life. These paintings are Madonna at the fountain and Madonna in the church. 
We will first examine the seated virgins. What do these four images show us? What basic visual information do they share and what sort of meaning do they suggest? The dominant visual element in all of the compositions is a seated figure clothed in what can be described as a huge red mantle. Van Eyck has created a goddess-like being that fills the throne in which she is seated. She seems the natural incarnation of supernatural sovereignty. Her massive scarlet costume visually defines this. No other 15th century Netherlandish painter presented her with such enormous and calculated dignity. The Virgin Mary's massive formality and regality can certainly be related to the social ideal of these images. The artist and his patrons believed that the appearance of power and wealth set forward by the nobility were a fitting model for the Virgin Mary, because her representations demonstrate an aristocratic and courtly ethos. Domestic religious imagery having donors in its composition was quite popular at that time. It's one of the best examples of the increasing ability of the 15th century Flemish society to appropriate personally and socially whatever religious message was deemed important. One's world, one's way of life, was in a sense the setting of the highest truth at one's own request. All of Van Eyck's religious paintings can be said to represent a trend in art to visualize an alternative to traditional church-based worship and ceremony. They depict a private world of adulation and prayer. Van Eyck's Luca Madonna is perhaps the artist's strongest statement of interest in modern devotion. This calm, maternal and domestic seeming image brings religious life home. So what is the religious meaning Van Eyck's virgins convey? Along with the notion of the Eucharist, the doctrine of Mary was one of the most often discussed and debated in the 15th century. She had, of course, conceived Christ in purity and in a state of virginity, but was she in turn immaculately conceived by her mother Anne? Was she, like Christ, an integral part of the divine plan of redemption, come to undo the sin of Eve, as Christ was to undo the sin of Adam? A high point in discussion about the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin was reached between 1435 and 1439 during the Council of Basel. The Council finally ruled in favor of the Immaculate Conception in 1439, however the doctrine of Mary's purity had to wait until the mid-19th century to receive its eventual papal blessing. This controversy in the 1430s has more than a passive relevance for Van Eyck's works. There are several ways in which Van Eyck can be said to advocate in favor of the doctrine of Immaculate Conception. Most significantly visually, he shows the Virgin to be such an ideal, otherworldly being that one could hardly doubt her power to overcome human limitations. On the frames of two of the paintings, the van der Paul panel and the Dresden triptych, Van Eyck has concluded his favorite Old Testament hymn to the Virgin. She is more beautiful than the sun, and above all the order of the stars. Being compared with the light, she is found before it. She is the brightness of the everlasting light and the unspotted mirror of the power of God. Other special elements in these paintings most likely allude to the issue of the Immaculate Conception. Lions are carved on the Luca Virgin's throne, reminding of the throne of Solomon, which in the Bible is described as having been adorned with many lions. The Virgin is seen to be as wise as the fabled King Solomon. Mary's divine wisdom knew her part in the plan of redemption, her role as the new Eve, come to undo the original sin of the first parents. In the Christ child's hand and on the windowsill in the Luca Madonna painting is what appears to be the fruit of paradise, that which tempted Adam and Eve. Carved on the throne in the von der Pale panel, are the figures of the first parents themselves. On the Virgin's lap, beside the Christ child in the same painting, is a parrot. As a talking bird, the parrot was thought to speak the word Ave, the beginning of the angelic salutation, Ave Maria, gratia plena. Hail Mary, full of grace. The wash basin in Luca Madonna might indicate her spiritual as well as physical cleanliness. These details give us a sense of Van Eyck's symbolism. The elements in his paintings reflect ideas and interest, stemming both from artist and patron. They most likely support the doctrine of Mary and belief in her immaculate conception that some in the 15th century felt. Although in Van Eyck's work there are occasional smaller features including alluding to the Virgin's purity, 
What is more striking is the monumental nature of Mary's image. It convinces us in the Virgin's power more than any of the clever details. In Van Eyck's works, physical size and display, which impacts us emotionally, is backed by fine intellectual reasoning. For Van Eyck's paintings, it's important to recognize the controversial nature of the Marian ideology found in them. The seated versions can certainly be understood as traditional images of devotion, objects of individual worship and prayer. At the same time, they are both suddenly and strongly linked to contemporary thinking and draw a relation between social status and religious controversy. The two paintings of the Virgin and Child that Van Eyck completed in the last two years of his life are remarkably different from the four seated figures executed previously. These two images are Virgin and Child by a fountain and Virgin and Child in a church. They show the Virgin who holds a tiny infant standing in a garden in the first and in the vast arches of a Gothic cathedral in the second. She is dressed in both, case, in both cases in a robe of cool and regal blue with a simple gold border. A soft atmospheric texture presides rather than the earlier hard-edged form. The Virgin seems to stand suspended in each case. A pale blue sky and various plants fill the background of one work, while the cathedral in the other panel is vast and filled with numerous effects of direct and indirect light. These elements provide a delicate atmospheric setting for the figures not found in the earlier, more geometrically designed interiors. The presumptive silence of an egg-seated virgins in the two late works is replaced with the suggestion of tinkling sounds, from a fountain in one and the high voices of two angels chanting in the distant choir in the other. There is a distinct change of emphasis between the seated and the standing virgins. The dominant concept earlier was physical. The virgins seemed somewhat grounded, but now it's gently ethereal, visionary. The virgin is undoubtedly one of the main focuses of Van Eyck's art. Never before in his art had anything been so fully, so clearly, so single-mindedly a reference to the virgin. Art historians attribute the visual change that appears in his final two portrayals of her to some outside source of influence. Where would Van Eyck have looked for inspiration? It is highly probable that it was the Byzantine icon. His dependence on a Byzantine model can be demonstrated in several aspects. The core of the icon is composed in the following way. Virgin's head above and gently displayed hands below, with the child in between, at least one of his knees raised, one arm extended toward the Virgin and his head in close contact with hers. In the icon, the Virgin wears a large blue cloak with an elegant gold border. The child is wrapped in his swaddling cloth, which hangs down from his thighs in strict vertical folds. These coloristic and drapery elements appear in Van Eyck's works as well, although they aren't simply copies. His version of the icon is highly stylized, but within his own Western terms. Throughout the 15th century, Van Eyck's images of the Virgin were repeatedly copied. This is certainly a tribute to the artist's impact of, on later generations. It's possible that Van Eyck was trying to create his own modern icon. It seems likely that by taking the Byzantine icon as an example, he was intent on creating his own up-to-date equivalent. Arnolfini Double Portrait The Arnolfini portrait is one of the most famous paintings in the history of European art. This work was completed in 1434 and is the only 15th century northern panel to survive in which the artist's contemporaries are shown engaged in some sort of action in a contemporary interior. The painting is full of symbols, and one wonders what it is, what it is that's taking place here. There's a long-standing debate among art historians about the meaning of the images. However, the most widely accepted opinion is that this man and woman are newly wed and wish to have children. They have removed their shoes before going to bed. The man's wooden clogs are sharply lit in the foreground. The woman's slippers are half hidden. Bared foot has been a common indicator of sexuality or fertility during many periods. The single candle and the dog are also to be understood as indicators of passion. A marriage candle was lit next to the bed for newlyweds in order to promote fertility. Dogs were held up by priests as examples of unbridled lust. The figure carved on the bedstead may have been intended by Van Eyck to represent St. Margaret, who, having been freed from a dragon, was made the patroness of childbirth, the guardian of the womb's fruitfulness. 
The man appears to gently greet or bless the woman. The woman responds by lifting her, her voluminous green robe, indicating her desire to become pregnant. Thus, almost all the features of the painting suggest a concern with sexuality, more particularly with fertility. Does Van Eyck depict members of the middle class, humble tradespeople of Bruges? The decorative artifacts in the painting suggest that it isn't the case. Inventories of the period reveal that the type of exquisite Anatolian rug laid down by the bed was one of the most precious possessions an, indiv an individual could own. The elaborate mirror with its enameled passion scenes and the finely wrought brass chandelier are equally signs of wealth. Oranges seen of the on the windowsill and the chests were costly imports from the south. This couple's clothes are also points to the fact that these people are well-to-do. The restrained colors of the man's clothing correspond to those favored by the Duke of Burgundy, and the similar large felt that can be seen in another Eyck portrait, worn by the Burgundian courtier Badouin de Lannoy. The woman's voluminous fur-lined robe has enormous sleeves with elegant dagging. The type of the little lapdog at her feet was the constant companion of noble women. One of the most striking aspects of this painting is its formality, its ritualized solemnity. This couple, along with the objects surrounding them, seem to form a living coat of arms. The reason, most probably, is that life at the Burgundian court was governed by a highly developed sense of etiquette. All actions, movements, and gestures were carefully regulated. The couple in the Arnolfini double portrait was clearly being portrayed observing the niceties of courtly etiquette. By means of carefully controlling facial expressions, the couple conveys a sense of detachment from others, as well as from the self. This painting is in the tradition of court portraiture and manuscript illumination. There is a tradition of presentation in miniatures, to which Van Eyck's Arnolfini double portrait is related. In these illuminations, we find many of the crucial elements of his panel painting. The interior with its air of tranquility, the bed, the floor covering, a household pet, windows providing an enticing prospect of the world outside, and the elegantly attired courtiers. These courtly illuminations are the only examples we have of such imagery prior to Van Eyck's pan painted panel. His work must be understood as having drawn, in certain ways, on this tradition. In this panel, Van Eyck creates a narrative of the kind of life the representatives of the upper middle class led. His choice of objects, the sense of historical documentation and reportage were admired by the court of Burgundy. Van Eyck's models were invoked and applied by many of his followers. Van Eyck's art can be generally described as devotional. A variety of religious themes and ideas can be elicited from his works, from private prayer to confession and pilgrimage. Once he had crystallized his approach in the image Virgin and Child with George van der Paul, all his other works seemed to form a series of variations on that theme. The same sorts of effects, each subtly rearranged and used anew. All Van Eyck's mature paintings look more alike one another than do the equivalent works by any other major 15th century Netherlandish painter. He is probably the only painter of that time who painted his panels with little assistance. Modern technical examination reveals that a number of hands were at work on the paintings of most other artists during this period, but from their delicate and laborious underdrawing to the many small adjustments made as the glazes were built up, Van Eyck's works are different, single-minded and completely his own. He wasn't only responsible for the labor, but also for the idea. Such homogeneity is a deliberate attempt to produce over and again a trademark, to give an unmistakable stamp to the world he creates. Monique's works are instantly recognizable. In part, he operated with a narrow range of themes and subject matter in order to make that so. The fact that Monique framed, signed, and dated his paintings surely indicates his awareness of the individual preciousness and mastery of his style. An interesting fact to round up the story a painting of St. George by Van Eyck was sold at an auction in Bruges in 1444 and presumably bought by the King of Naples. What does it suggest that a work of the artist was publicly sold to a wealthy and influential patron of the arts just three years after the Van Eyck's death? It's highly unlikely that the prospective owner's name was George or that he had a particular devotion to that saint or cult. 
He simply wanted to work by one of the most famous and influential artists of the 15th century Europe, and he obtained it at a quite worldly, secular event, an auction. This sale is a piece of evidence that indicates the 15th century in Europe was the age of Monique.